Lord Jesus, this morning we come to praise you, Lord Jesus. We come to give you all the glory that you deserve because you have done something so amazing for us. For all eternity, we can celebrate the inheritance that we have. We can celebrate the favor that we are now living in. We can celebrate the free favors that profusely abound in our lives as beloved children of yours. Lord Jesus, as we have this time right now to feed on your word, I pray, open the eyes of the blind, Lord Jesus. I pray you speak life into situations. Lord, I pray for your favor to superabound in every area. For all the people here today or listening on YouTube, Lord, bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Today, I want to talk to you about Jubilee. That is why I was shaking when our dear sister here, Gina, was saying Jubilee, Jubilee. And um, I guess you wouldn't mind remind me telling everybody, well, I was going to anyway, but Jubilee is celebrated once every 50 years. So now you know um, how young somebody is. <laughs> but she was proud to declare that, and she doesn't look 50, does she? Yes, must be the husband speaking words of, of life to her, amen? Making her youth being renewed, amen? And that is the truth of the gospel. When the words of our husband, Jesus, get spoken onto us, saying, you are wonderful, you are accepted, you are forgiven, our youth is restored. You know, our health is restored to us. That is the beauty of the gospel that we live in now. And for us who are under grace, we need to understand what Jubilee really represents. Jubilee is not just her birthday last Saturday. Jubilee actually is a picture of where we stand right now through Jesus. He, the Bible says He has opened that way for us. You know, when He came to declare the year of the Lord's favour, he was, in essence, declaring this is the year of Jubilee. Mm -hmm. So for us who do not know or don't have a clear idea of what is Jubilee, today is going to be a wonderful time for you. It will open up your minds to see what happened in the Old Testament that's going to be showing Jesus and Jesus crucified. Amen. Paul says in the book of Corinthians, he says, only, thing I, one, only one thing I desire, to see Jesus, to know Jesus and know Jesus crucified. If that's all you know, you actually have everything. Everything, every blessing is found in Jesus crucified for you. You don't need to, 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 to go to Bible college or you know, have, a, have three or four master's degree or whatever. The only thing you need to know is Jesus crucified. And the more you know of that, the more you meditate on the finished work, the more you know of the new covenant that you're in, the favor that He has opened for you, you are going to go from glory to glory. Amen. Your youth will be renewed. Yes. You will walk and reign in life. You will run and not be weary. Amen. You will walk. Did I say walk? You will run and not be faint. <laughs> I'm not quoting that correctly, but probably because that just um, is not part of the sermon. Amen. <laughs> but Jesus crucified. And that's what church should be all about. Jesus crucified. Yes. Let that be the first priority. And when that happens, Jesus is lifted up. He draws all men unto him, unto him, and you see favor, free favor of God coming your way in every area. So what is the Jubilee? Jubilee, my daughter, my youngest daughter, her middle name is Jubilee. Uh, that, that, that is, that's how much it means to me. Uh, in 2017, when I was in uh, Singapore on holiday, I was there for the first Sunday of um, Pastor Prince's church and on, during the first Sunday he normally gives the theme of the year so if you would have been following him you would know in 2017 it was the year of Jubilee so at that point me and my wife we knew of the first name for our daughter which is Karis which means grace um, Karis but we're thinking what's, what's, what's a middle name what's a nice middle name and we couldn't come up with something you know um, that was nice then when we heard the year of Jubilee in my heart I thought that's it Jubilee, that sounds nice. Even though um, the very first time I've heard of that as a name was a character from X-Men. But, um, <laughs> but the real meaning of Jubilee is so significant that I wanted to name my daughter that. And I wanted that to be, 
kind of selfish the way I named my children <laughs> because I wanted to remind me, you know, of, of what, what God has done. You know, grace, jubilee, jubilee. So what is this jubilee that we're talking about? For us to understand that, and by the way, she goes by the name Jubi now, short form, J-U-B-I. <laughs> Jubi, we don't call her Carrie, so if you want to get her attention and get her to give you a hug, best way is to say Jubi, not Carrie. Amen. <laughs> but we have to go back to Leviticus chapter 25 to actually understand this, I would say, concept or this, th th this construct of Jubilee. Essentially, what it is, is that every 50 years, that's why 50 was the number that was used earlier, every 50 years, there would be one special year, one special year where it's, a, it's like a, a pardon. That particular year, all debts were cancelled. I said all debts were cancelled. Everything would be paid for by somebody else. All debts are cancelled. If you were a slave and you had sold yourself to slavery because you were poor, you were released from that immediately and you can go back to your own family. If you were poor and you required to sell your house, right? And many people in those days might have been that way. If you had to sell your house, on that particular year, let's say you sold your house for $100,000, you had already received the money, 100 k but on that particular year, the house gets transferred back to your name, just like that, and you do not need to give back the 100 k The free favour, the cancellation of debt, it, the release from captivity, because if you're in slavery, you're caught up in cap captivity. If you are owing something, you're bound by that. And just imagine if you had to, if you're so poor, you, you made some bad financial decisions and you had to give up your house. Imagine what that feels like. You, you have to sell your house today and then you have to rent maybe opposite the, the next street of where your house was and you look every day at your house and you see the, the new owners there. That actually makes you quite sad, right? It makes you feel like, oh, what have I done? You know, wh why am I... I didn't, I'm not good enough you know, in doing those things. But the good news in Jubilee, that is a picture of how it gets restored back to you. Everything gets restored back to you, to its original owner, to its original condition. That's why Jubilee is such a significant construct in grace, because that is essentially what Jesus has done for us. He's ushered us back into this new era of grace the acceptable year of the Lord, the year where His favour is there for you, not a year where you are bound by slavery to sin, to works, to self-effort, but you're actually free, set free once and for all, and there's a celebration to it. There's a celebration to it. Jubilee, where you get the word jubilation, jubilant. It was a jubilant time of celebration when the Brisbane Broncos won the title or whatever, you can tell I don't follow that, you know, but or um, we were jubilant when we found out that we were expecting a child, you know, it's a celebration, it's a, and, and that, that actually captures what happens when your debt has been cancelled, you know, when you have had a huge debt cancelled, what is your response? Hallelujah, it's a celebration. No longer am I indebted to Commonwealth Bank or no longer am I indebted to this person. I am free. I don't need to have that shame anymore. I don't need to, have be, to be bound by that, that sense of failure anymore. All my sins, all my wrong actions, cancelled, restored, and I'm restored back to original condition, the way our Father actually wants us to be. That is the significance of Jubilee, and I probably gone through the first six slides there already, but let's look at the slides, amen, so that we can have a clearer idea. In order to understand Jubilee, you have to understand that it is, uh, it is founded actually on rest, all right? There's a rest in there, and as we go along today, you will see more and more of that. God works on the cycle of seven. Six days of creation, He rested on the seven. In the same way, you know, in, in, in Israel right now, or the Jews, they have that Sabbath, right? They have six days of work and then one day off. 
uh, as a Sabbath, a practice of rest. They do that for days, but they also do that for years. So here we go. This is God speaking to Moses. Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I shall give you, then the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its crop. But during the seven years, the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field nor prune your vineyard. And you know, if you understand, you know, if you've done a bit more research in that, the goodness of God and His wisdom is amazing. Because in the sixth year, you might think, okay, then wh wh where's my food going to come from in year seven? In the sixth year, He gives a double portion so that there's plenty, so there's enough for seven and that is enough for year eight as well. When you rest, you get a double portion. Amen. How's that? Isn't that good? But we keep on going. Um, that, is the, that is the law of the Sabbath, right? And in the same chapter, drop down to verse eight, and you shall count seven Sabbaths. So one Sabbath is constituted six years and one year rest. That's one Sabbath year. You shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years, and the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. So 49 years, seven times seven, everybody agree that is correct mathematically? Oh, I don't need you to agree, I know it is. Amen. <laughs> seven times seven. But year number 50, that is when the jubilee occurs. So seven years times seven. There's a lot of seven in there. Seven is the number of rest. Seven is the number of completion, amen? When God completed, he rested from all his work. So just know jubilee, there's a lot of, there's a theme of rest in the background with that. And we'll go on to that a little bit later. But, okay, we keep reading. And you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty. Say liberty. Liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. So as I was talking about earlier, if you're interested more in this, it's a whole chapter in, verse, in chapter 25. We don't have time to go through it, but essentially it is a rest from working the land. It is a redemption of property. So if you had, all, if you had sold your property because you were poor, it is restored back to your, or your name, just like that. No questions asked. You know, it's kind of like, um, uh, never mind. <laughs> we won't waste time with that. Manu mission, a freedom from that as well. If you sold yourself into slavery, you are then released from that. And you and your children and your family can go back to your original place. What a wonderful thing. No wonder there's celebration there. And there's a remission of all debts. But essentially, it is about redemption. You know, you are then able to be redeemed out of whatever you were enslaved to, whether you were bound by slavery. In, in right now, what, what the application is to us is perhaps you may be bound to, to your past failures. Perhaps you may be bound to your, your sins that you think that you are still being punished for. There's a freedom from that. Perhaps that you're, you're still bound to your own self-effort, to your own the wisdom of the world. You don't need to be bound by that anymore. There's liberty in the house of the Lord. Amen. So that is essentially Leviticus 25, a jubilee. And that is what Jesus was actually declaring when he came in Luke chapter 4, when he came and he went into the synagogue in Nazareth. Can we have the next slide? Thank you. And then he actually read from the scroll. And many of us are familiar with this, but it would be good for us to just read through the verses. Amen. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. So what happened was uh, customary for, for young Jewish men or Jewish men in those days to be there. And if you're a, a learned teacher or something like that, they might give you that honor, you know, to, to read out, you know, whatever was the reading for that day. So they handed it to him. So imagine the scroll was handed it to him, and this is what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. 
because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release or liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Next one. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So he, what he was actually saying right there, he was ushering in the new era of grace, the new era of jubilee, the acceptable year of the Lord. Israel was not observing jubilee you know, uh, at that time because they, they, they decided why should we rest from the land you know, and all of that. And that was the reason why they were taken into captivity by Babylon you know, before. But, so he came to announce it, to bring it back you know, to what it should be, jubilee. But it's, it's not so much uh, an observa ob observation of the law, but he was actually saying, this is a new era that I'm ushering you into, the acceptable year of the Lord. Today is the day of celebration. Today is the day. It's not a one-day thing, but it's, he's ushering in. It's now. This period is the era of grace. It's the era of jubilee, where there's no more slavery, where there's sight to the blind. He binds the brokenhearted. He cancels debts. I said he cancels debts. Amen. Amen. And he restores you to your original condition. Amen? Amen? That means there is no remembrance of badness there. Because when He created you, He created you good. Amen? Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 to 2, or verse 1 to 3. We don't have it in the slides there. But we go back to, you want to turn to it if you want, uh, while, we're, while I'm going back to the, the previous slide, Daniel. You know, when the one where I underlined the, the favorable year of the Lord? Dactos year of the Lord. Dactos year of the Lord means favorable, of course. <laughs> but we go on, there we go. Thea, uh, a Greek scholar says, denotes the most blessed time when salvation and the free favors of God profusely abound. So Jesus stood there and he said, I'm fulfilling this prophecy right now. I'm saying from this moment, from my ministry onwards, the free favors of God, <coughs> salvation, profusely abound, <coughs> super aboundedly abound, or whatever the term is. You know, it, your cup overflows, amen? Because of the free favors of God, from that moment when he stood and declared, today is the day of salvation. Today is the year of Jubilee from here onwards for all eternity. And that's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 that I've asked you to turn to, it says Paul is writing, he's writing to the Corinthian church. He's saying, brothers, I'm just paraphrasing, but he said, brothers, I urge you not to take the grace of God in vain. And can somebody read verse 2 for me because I can't remember. <laughs> in a favorable time, I listened to you and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Amen. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of salvation. Today is the day, the acceptable year of the Lord. Paul uses that exact same dectos. He says today, he says, don't take the grace of God in vain. He was saying, don't just hear it and just have it of no benefit to you. He's saying, recognize that today is your opportunity. Recognize the significance, the cancellation of debts, the freedom from captivity, the free favors of God that profusely abound to you. Today, grasp hold of it. Run with it. He said, don't let it be in vain to you. That is the favorable year of the Lord that Jesus has opened up for us. That is why when we have jubilee, there's celebration. There's singing and joy in the house of the Lord. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. Because He has broken down the barriers. We can now freely run in, if I can don't choke myself here, <laughs> and access the free favors of God. Amen. Next one. So this is the exact... Um, 
text that he was reading from. And so he was actually given the scroll from Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 to 2, uh, which basically says the same thing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And there's one more part of that, to declare the day of vengeance. Amen. But if you've been studying grace for a while, you would know that Jesus, when he stood up to read, at that, he left that out. No more vengeance. Because the vengeance would all be directed towards him. No longer to us who are in the acceptable year of the Lord. So he just shut the book there and he handed it back to the attendant and he said, today this is fulfilled in your sight, in the presence. What a, what a moment. What a hair, uh, hair raising moment, right? When imagine, you know, they, are, they, they revere the prophets, amen. And, they, and the prophecy was about this person that would do it. And he was standing right there and he said, today I am fulfilling it for you. To, that's why it says, today is the day of salvation. This, that's, th there was a song that is in my head. Um, this morning was, This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Celebrate the presence of the Lord. <laughs> Celebrate. Never mind, we don't need to sing that. But when we sing these songs nowadays, they take on new meaning. It's not just, it's a new day, you know, the weather is a bit hotter today or there's no rain today or something, or today I'm, I'm going to work. What that song actually should be referring to, I don't know what the original author intended it for, is that today is your day of favour. Today is the day it has been opened for you. We are now in the acceptable year of the Lord. Celebrate. Rejoice in the Lord. Be jubilant. Have a jubilant shout of joy, amen, amen. to the Lord. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but we go into liberty right there. That's why I say this word, deror, was the same word in Leviticus 25 that we went through earlier, the same word. So Jesus clearly is referencing jubilee you know, at this time when he stood up, oh, that, that, that prophecy was about that. Grace, the covenant of righteousness by faith was open to us at that point. Amen. We're going to look a little bit deeper into a few words in Leviticus 25 that really, I'm sure, is going to bless you. Amen. I've underlined Jubilee there. Oh, can we go back? It's supposed to be a surprise, but everybody saw it now. <laughs> hmm. So, for those of you who didn't see the answer, <laughs> what does Jubilee actually mean? Literally. Maybe it was too fast. Yeah. Jubilee, yes, uh, it means, but literally in the Hebrew language, it means your bell. And I guess that's where you can connect it, your bell, your belly, or something like that. I don't speak Hebrew, but... Yobel, Y-O-B-E-L. What does Yobel actually mean? Next one. Yobel actually literally means a ram's horn. So he, in essence, when, 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 when God was speaking to Moses, he says, it will be the year of Jubilee. It will be the year of the ram's horn. And, and maybe <laughs> Moses is thinking, okay, um, or maybe if, if, you are, if you had your debt cancelled that, on that year, you probably don't care what, what year it, it's called, as long as you get your debt cancelled, right? But there's a great significance in the ram's horn. For, uh, probably some of you are already connecting the dots. But that's why you know, other translations of Leviticus 25 would say, you shall then sound a ram's horn. In the New King James Version, it says, you shall then sound a jubilee, all right? But it's the same thing. You shall then send a ram's horn abroad on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound a horn all through your land. All right? Next one, please. In order to understand what the ram's horn really represents, you know, you have to look in the Bible to let it interpret itself. You know, the law of first mention. So the very first time a ram's horn is actually depicted in the Bible is in the book of Genesis. It is in the time where Abraham 
was about to sacrifice Isaac. Everybody knows that story? Yes. And here it is, Genesis 22, verse 13. It says, Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. So what does the ram's horn represent? It represents a sacrifice. It represents the sacrifice of Jesus. It represents the provision. Rather than we need to produce our Isaac for sacrifice, God delivers and provides the ram, the, 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 the true unblemished sacrifice. Amen. He provides it for us. And so the ram's horn is a picture of Christ. So when you actually look at, you understand a little bit more, when you, the year of Jubilee, the year of the ram's horn, the year of the sacrifice of Christ, the year of the offering of Jesus as a burnt offering, then you have the free favours of God. Everybody got that? I say again, the year of Jubilee represents the year of the ram's horn. And the ram's horn is only, you only get a ram's horn when you kill a ram. You don't, don't just go to a ram and pluck out its horn. It says the ram was provided. Normally a ram doesn't get caught by the horn. The ram gets caught by its um, fur. Is that what it's called? Wool. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> Fleece? Yes. Same thing, right? You can tell I'm not uh, agricultural, but um, I'm learning. It's my third language, yes. And my second language is not very good already. <laughs> but usually, a, a, a ram or an animal is caught in the bush by its, you know, its fur and its clothing. Um, it's wool, it's please. Yes, thank you. But here, this ram that was provided for, it was not caught. There was no blemish there. That's a picture of Jesus. It was voluntarily offered. You could say, no ram goes in head first and say, okay, yes, that's me. Okay, uh, cut me up and have me for dessert or something like that. But it's, it's a voluntary sacrifice that what Jesus has done for us. And so, how do you know it is the year of Jubilee? How did the, uh, what was the instruction that was given to Moses, to the, to the Levites, the priests, how do the people of Israel know it's Jubilee? All right, and I, I've, I've covered it before. You just have to blow a trumpet, sound the trumpet of the Jubilee, and the whole land will know it's a new year. The, it, it, how they used trumpets in Israel was not necessarily for musical purposes. It was actually quite strategic. It was for movement. It's for coronation of kings. It's for war, right? And it's also for a declaration that it's the new year. So they would actually take the ram's horn and they would sound a loud blast, or whatever the sound is, of the shofar, that's what it's called. And the whole land will know, it is the, the year of Jubilee. This year I'm free. This year is free. After 49 years of serving this wretched master, I can finally go home. <laughs> or after... Uh, after having to sell my property, it's now mine. I'll kick you out, you know. <laughs> Don't stay miles. But, you know, as I was meditating on this in when, I, when I was preparing, you know, somebody who has been in debt 49 years would be much more celebrating, celebratory or happier than somebody who was in debt maybe four days, you know, or four months. And that's why I think Jesus would say, keep tripping over this, Jesus would say, he who is forgiven much, loves much. If you know that all your sins has been, have been forgiven, you will love God. As we were singing one of the songs today, I can't help but love you more when more and more I see how good you are to me, how much you have forgiven me. You know, and that is a tip that I'm trying to learn for husbands and wives. <laughs> but you shall cause the trumpet of the jubilee, the teruah of the jubilee is translated teruah, to sound on the 10th day of the 7th month. We've read that, right? This phrase, teruah, refers to a, an alarm, a blowing of the trumpets. 
a joyful noise. That's why it says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Or when you see in the Bible, in the book of Psalms, it says, shout joyfully. That is actually teruah. That's actually celebrate. It's not just shouting for the sake of making noise. It's shouting that, oh, it's a liberty. It's a freedom. Whenever whoever comes here to play the tennis tournament in a month's time, whenever he wins and he hits the final point, he shouts. He said, yes. Why, why does he say it's yes? Because there's nothing that's going to ever rewrite history. He's won the tournament 20, is it still on? 28, 2018 Brisbane International. It's mine. Nobody can ever take it from me. The name will be engraved not on one of those trophies, but on a trophy somewhere. You know, it's finished. I don't need to train anymore. I might put down my record for a few days and I'll enter the next tournament, but it's finished. It's a celebration. It's a rest that's involved in that as well. But that is the sound of the trumpet when you actually say, finish. You have done it for me. Done. Cancellation of debts. Freedom from whatever I've been going through. It's done. That's why we shout joyfully. It's not a matter of how loud you shout but more of the conviction of how free you are, how forgiven, how much you've been forgiven. Amen? We go into the next slide, the book of Joshua. The Lord spoke to me as I was preparing for this. The walls of Jericho, what happened at Jericho, was an actual <laughs> representation of Jubilee in action. And some of you are already saying yes, which I'm very thankful for. So I don't need to spend too much time, you know, trying to convince you. I don't need to convince you because that's what the Lord actually said to me. And He showed me many things, you know, in this chapter that I want to now deliver. And I'm sure you're going to be very blessed. For those of you who don't know, Jericho was a fortified city. It had walls. That's why the walls needed to come tumbling down. The children of Israel were trying to get in and take the city, but there were walls in place. Amen. So we just read a few of these um, verses, and I'll give you some of my thoughts on that. Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand. Take note, it's already been given. Amen with its king and the valiant warriors. You shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. I've underlined a couple of things there, you know. One, no one went out and no one came in. That is a picture of captivity, right? There, there's nobody that's allowed to get out, nobody allowed to go in. It's a picture of being bound, right? And as we look in Leviticus, you know, it's freedom, for, the, for those who are captives. I've underlined you shall do so for six days because in the original Sabbath, right, you, you have to work for six days and rest on the seventh. In Joshua, oh now we keep reading. Next verse, please. Also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns, same word, jubilee, before the ark. Then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and all the people will go up, every man straight ahead. There's a lot of the number seven in there. If you actually count the number of sevens that are recorded in Joshua chapter 6, whether it's um, seven trumpets or seventh, TH, seventh day, there are actually 14 times that it has its mentioned. 14 times, how you get 14? You get two, two sevens, right? Seven times seven. That's what the Jubilee was. Seven years of seven Sabbath. Seven Sabbath years. So seven times seven, 49. All seven priests is a Levitical thing. That was what hap was happening. Well, that was the instruction that was given to the Levites. Seven horns. It, it's that picture that God is trying to show. This morning, e even if that wasn't enough, God woke me up and He said, count the number of verses in this, in this chapter. 
27, two sevens, seven sevens, the number of divine completion, right? Seven sevens, what Jubilee actually represents, seven times seven, 49. On the 50th year, that's when the Jubilee occurs. Amen. We'll keep reading. So Joshua, the son of Nun, or Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. Then he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men go on before the Ark of the Lord. We won't read all the verses. You know, I'll leave that to your time. We can drop down to maybe verse 16. I think it should be in the one or two slides. Yeah. But essentially what they were doing is they were circling around um, Jericho for six days and they were doing so with, the, the ram's horn was actually blowing but it wasn't the long blast. It was actually just a, it was a shorter kind of blast that was just signaling them for movement, you know, but it was still present with them. They were still marching along with Jesus really, our jubilee, amen, the ram's horn, the sacrificial lamb. Only on the seventh day, after all of that, when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. It says, Shout, because it's yours. I have already given it to you. These people are marching out there. If you're in the army, you know that shouting does not destroy a wall. You know, you're better off throwing a cannonball or something like that to the wall. But this is really a, the way of God, you know. The ways of the world may not work, you know, but the ways of God will confound the mighty and the wise, amen. But he says, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. What happens then? What they actually do before shouting, they have a long blast on the ram's horn. They declare that jubilee, freedom, or cancellation of debts and the people rejoice. Why? Because it says God has already given them the city. It's not shout because in order to get the city. It is shout because God has already given you the city. And so shouted is that same word, teruah, which is shout joyfully. Don't, sh don't, don't shout out of a I'll shout how loud my, I'll show you how loud my voice is kind of shouting. But it's a shout of Yes, of celebration, the free favor of God. I don't need to take out my cannonball and throw it. I don't need to punch the wall. I just shout and I walk and I take the spoils of war. That is essentially the covenant, the jubilee, the grace, the favor that we are all in right now. We just need to sound the ram's horn. And what is that? Declare the finished work of God. Declare Jesus crucified. And make a joyful noise. When that happens, naturally, you want to shout. Naturally, it, you, may, you may shout in your heart. You know, you, I'll, I'll give you a, a real-life example. In 2013, um, I, I started running my own business. So in 2013, um, I gathered with, with a few other peers who also have been running their own business for a while. So I went to that meeting uh, in just to get some tips, you know, uh, some advice on what it is like to, to run your own business and all of that. And so when I went there, um, I was quite disappointed. You know why? Because in that meeting, all those people who had been running their own businesses, they started to say, um, actually, this is what we need to do. They, they were actually talking a lot about very, I would say, a bit unethical, a bit unscrupulous methods of gaining more business, you know, g gaining um, more income, you know. And, and that, that just didn't sit very well with me, you know, I just, I just sat there at the meeting and, okay, and you, plus, you must remember at that time in 2013, um, that, was, that was my first venture out to start a business, you know, it's not like I had a million dollars in the bank and I don't, still don't, but, you know, <laughs> it's not like I was cash rich, it was a time where it was a risk for me, because, you know, when you start your own business, you need to normally put in more money initially. At that time, my eldest son was coming to one years old around that period, so I had a family to provide for. And so it would, in my heart, as I left that meeting, I thought, you know, maybe I do need to do some of these things that these people were doing, you know. Maybe 
just how it is. This is this is the ways of the world. I just need to um, don't be so idealistic, you know. Don't 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 be so uh, rigid. Just conform a little bit to what 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 everybody does, you know. So I was driving home in the car, but uh, I just started to to meditate, you know. Maybe the verses started coming to mind, you know, of, of the covenant that we have in grace, you know. And I was just thinking, oh Jesus, you bless me, you bless me, Jesus. My favor is found in you, Jesus. Um, my provision comes from you, not from the ways of the world. I was meditating a little bit, and then when I finally hit a traffic light and, and I stopped, and finally uh, that that bonus just came. It's almost like a release, you know. After meditating on you know the favor of God, and suddenly I just shouted in my car, you know. And thank God I was alone, you know. <laughs> and thank God it's a car; you can do whatever you want, you know. Maybe the person next door was thinking, "Who's this? What's this guy doing?" You know. But I just shouted, no, my blessing comes from Jesus alone. I prosper because He prospers me, not, not some what, what the world does. You know, and so when I had that shout, I, I didn't realize what I was doing back then, but that was essentially that. Celebrate, yes, I don't need to try and knock down the wall with my own strength. I have the victory already. I just need to declare the finished work of God and see the free favors of God just flow in my life. And that was in 2013, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. That's 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Six. <laughs> Never mind. For all eternity, amen. But in the last six years, We'll debate on that later, maybe. <laughs> but for the last, however, since 2013, I have prospered. Amen. In my business, my business has prospered. Not really, not because of my own skill or my own strategy, or I haven't used any of those strategies that they were the recommending. But I have been blessed. I've seen favor upon favor. The free favor just profusely abound. You know, sometimes I have to, I have to, I have to sit and think. Wow, where did this come from? It's something like what Willie was sharing with me. And I think Willie and, and Joseph, you work together in, as personal trainers in a gym. You know, he was, he was telling me, you know, it's quite competitive being a personal trainer, right? Because there are a lot of there, a lot of people there. And people that go to the gym, I guess they want to be left alone. And they think they know better or something like that, you know. Um, but he was saying, wow, he now has a rest, you know. When he goes to work, he doesn't need to like, oh, where's my next client? You know, trying to zero in on somebody like some personal trainers might do. And, you know, even his colleagues at work are noticing, oh, you, you should, come on, you should need to, you know, be like us and, you know, have some uh, fire and get something, you know, get more clients. That's the ways of the world, amen. But the ways of God, the ways of grace, because he is in a new covenant, because he is in the acceptable year of the Lord, where free favors super abound, he says, people just approach him. His business flourishes. And I speak that to everybody. Amen. Because it is available to us. Because it has been fulfilled by Jesus. Amen. Regarding this Jericho and the fortified walls, I was thinking about this and, and I think God was just impressing on my heart. Maybe there's some of us today, the walls, you know, the covenant, you know the covenant of grace. You know that there's a promised land there. You know that there is favor that has already been won for you. But there are fortified walls that are blocking your way. And some of the fortified walls may be your mistakes in the past, your sin, your bad habits, your bad temper, a poor financial decision, the way you uh, feel like you have no talent, you feel that you're not good enough, you feel that you're undeserving, essentially. And for years, you have been trying to use your own cannonball or, or, or a tool or something like that to break down the walls yourself, self-effort, essentially, trying to, trying to get there. Today is the day of salvation. Today, you don't need to do that. Today, just stand firm and say, Jesus, you are the finished work. 
you crucified has opened up the way for me. Because you are crucified for me, I can now walk and step into the promised land. I can step into a land that where the free favors of God just flow in me. Take, a, take away your eyes from you know, all these insecurities that you have. Put your eyes you know, on Jesus who has already won you the victory. Amen. He has won it for you so you can celebrate and enjoy the inheritance as we, as we do in communion. I celebrate and partake of the inheritance. If you're a student, just know your path is clear. There's favor for you. If you're in work, just know you do not need to rely on the ways of the world. If your health is not good, just know that He has already won your healing for you. It's a matter of just waiting for the healing to manifest. Amen. That is Jericho. That is a story of how Jubilee is actually represented, you know, and it's a very powerful story. See your walls come tumbling down, amen. In closing, I want to go into another part of the Old Testament, and we are still at 10.45, so we're fine. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just summarize this story in case some of your watches are incorrect. Um, this story essentially was Balak and Balaam. You know, have you heard of Balaam's donkey, the talking donkey in, in, in the Bible? Very interesting. But we don't have time to go into the details of that. Just know that Balak was the king of Moab. And you know, Mo and at that time, it, this was a time where the children of Israel were, had come out of Egypt and they were multiplying, they were prospering. So the king of Moab looked at them and he said, man, this is scary. I need to find a way to exterminate them, to get rid of them. They are threat, a threat to me and my kingdom. So he calls out Balaam, a man uh, of God. And he says, essentially, he says to Balaam, now you, I want you to look at them and I want you to curse them for me. He said, I want you to curse them. You're a man of God, your curse will be powerful. <laughs> essentially, that's what he's thinking. So cut the long story short, Balak goes then, not Balak, Balaam goes to seek uh, the Lord and, he's, and then he just regurgitates word for word what God has, has spoken about the Israelites. Balak wanted him to speak bad, to speak death, you know, into these people. And what was, and three times he tried it and three times Balaam came back with just blessings. <laughs> he just couldn't help his mouth because he just says, I just need to say, what God says to me. And Balak was like, man, I asked you to curse them while you bless them, <laughs> you know. And, and he was panicking because, you know, his kingdom, in his opinion, was under threat. Um, next slide. This is the one I want to focus. This is in the, maybe the second time he did that. And this is the word of the Lord that came to Balaam. And then he told, this is what God told me to say, to speak over the Israelites. Behold, I have received a command to bless. When he has blessed, then I cannot revoke it. I said, I cannot revoke it. <laughs> Amen. Imagine more what Moab is thinking there. He has not observed misfortune in Jacob, Jacob meaning Israel, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord, his God, is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Same word, teruah, the shout, the blast of the ram's horn is among them. Because of that, the children of Israel would not be cursed. They would receive an irrevocable blessing because the shout of a king. What is that shout of the king? The blast of the trumpet, you know, that essentially says, finished, ram's horn, it's for me, the sacrifice, it's done. They are in the acceptable year of the Lord. They have been released from slavery, which they were released from Egypt, Amen. They were released and now they are restored back. They came out with gold and silver. None were weak, but they were strong. Amen. That was what was there for them. You know, that is what is there for us today. When we have that shout of triumph, of jubilee, of victory, of celebration, no weapon formed against us will prosper. God has blessed us and it's an irrevocable blessing. You cannot take it back because 
it is founded on the sacrifice of Jesus. Because if he would have to take back a blessing, that means he would have to undo what Jesus did. But we know when Jesus cried out, finished, it means finished. It cannot be undone. When you win a tournament, done. I'm 2019 Brisbane International Champion. Nobody can rewrite that history. But how much more when God has won it for us? There's no, no curse that could come our way. Claim that. Amen. Believe that. That is true for you in your situation. Whatever situation that you are facing, know that when you sound the trumpet, you know, that is you declaring the death of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus. Rest in that. Jubilee is a time of rest. Rest in that. Rest in the finished work of God. See your walls come tumbling down. Don't look at the wall. Look at Jesus. Look at Him and see your salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. Today is the day to rejoice because of what He's done for us. I have uh, just a, a little thing about um, something quite interesting that I want to share. Probably not this one. It's probably not on the slides. Um, can anybody name the first musician in the Bible? Anybody know that? Sorry? Henry, was it? <laughs> Miriam? I don't expect you to know because I didn't know this as well. <laughs> it's... It's all the way in the book of Genesis, chapter 4, verse 21, if you want to look it up. This person's name was Jubal, J-U-B-A-L. It says he was the father or the first of all who played the harp or the organ. He was the first musician. I want to bring this up because, and Jubal comes from the, the word Yobel, you know, the ram's horn. It comes from the word jubilee, all right? And you can see the similarities even in how it's spelled. But when it comes to playing songs, when it comes to singing of worship to God, the first priority is always about celebrating the jubilee, celebrating the ram's horn, celebrate, celebrating the crucifixion and the death of our Lord Jesus and what He's done and what He's opened up to us. When that is the true purpose of worship. And when you, that's why worship then becomes such an important time. Because when you're in that moment and the songs remind you of the finished work, the songs remind you of the covenant, you actually move away from your moment of self-doubt, self-effort or whatever, and you move into this place where you finally say, oh, Amen, I trust God. Okay, I've, I've, I came into service a bit stressed, but... You know what? That song says, I'm forgiven. I, I'm going to be favoured. Okay. So therefore, worship is such an important time, not just corporately, but in your own time. Worship, not just to make a nice sound, and not, of, not many of us can, not all of us play instruments, but the whole point of your worship is not really for a musical quality. It's more for, for you to sound the alarm, you know, of jubilee. That first purpose, that's why Jubal was the father of all who played the instruments. You know, that's just something for you. You know, I know there may be some, a lot of musicians or people who like to sing. Um, or All of us like to worship God. But when you have this truth, you know, then the worship time that you have breaks down walls for you. When you're actually singing those songs personally to yourself, the walls come tumbling down and you can inherit all the promises of God. Amen. That is Jubal. But um, let's close, amen. The shout of a king, amen. We close with this. In Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, what was happening there? It says, when Jesus had cried out, or in, a la uh, in another translation, had shouted, he had cried out again in a loud voice, he yielded up his spirit. There he was shouting on that cross as well. Thankfully, John records what actually he cried out. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he yielded up his spirit. His spirit. He shouted, he declared, Finished! 
No more work to be done. Cancellation of debts. Free favors of God profusely abound in your life. He shouted. He, the ram, the sacrificial ram, the horn that was being broken in that process, shouted. He sounded his own alarm right there, declaring, finish, freedom, liberty, no more captivity, no more bound. Your brokenheartedness is no more there. Sight to the blind, free favors of God. The significance of the cross, that's exactly what happened. He shouted out on the cross for you. I mentioned a bit earlier, the blowing of the trumpet is used for different purposes. One of the purposes is, to, is for the coronation of a king. When Solomon was anointed king, they blew the trumpet and they said, this is rise and anoint Solomon. In this same way, what a wonderful picture right there. Jesus was crucified. He was sounding the ram's horn at that moment, shouting, finished. And that was a coronation of our king. King of all kings. King of all kings. Worthy to be praised. King of all disease. King of all poverty. King of all captivity. King of all slavery. King of everything. The shout of a king was done on the cross for us. Therefore, there's no way we can be cursed anymore. But there's only blessings that's going to come our way. Blessing upon blessing, the irrevocable blessing. Amen. So today, I think that's it. I think I want to conclude here. Today, know that you know, the free favors of God are there for you. you know? Amen. The free favors of God, it is the acceptable year of the Lord. It is, you're now living in grace. You're now living in jubilee. You're not living under the law anymore. And cancellation of debts. Just go out in, in, your, in, in your lives knowing that I don't owe anything anymore. In fact, I get gifts given to me, jubilee. It is, it, literally, it will be your 50th birthday every day. <laughs> and how, maybe some of us who are a bit younger maybe don't want that. <laughs> but maybe some of us will love that. Amen. <laughs> But maybe I should stop there. Amen. Why don't we? Um, I'll just give a ask each and everyone to bow your heads at this point. I just want to um, give an opportunity to those who do not know Jesus, who want to receive Jesus into their hearts. So today you've been hearing about the goodness of God, how God wants to favor you, how there's no more vengeance to you. If you're listening on 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 the YouTube, know that God is for you. Amen. And all you need to do is say, Jesus. I receive you, I believe in you. So if you want to receive Jesus into your heart this moment, pray this prayer with me. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross for me. When you did that, you removed all my sins. You brought me into your kingdom. And because of that, I have access to the free favors of God in my life. I thank you for your sacrifice. I celebrate and I rejoice in my inheritance that has been won for me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.